Hello there, welcome back. Today we're going to look at two Albert Brooks films. Real life and defending your life. Yeah, two films with life in it. In the titles. Um, one was, uh, the first one was his debut film. And it's much rougher and lower budget. The second one, Defend Your Life, is a studio film. was Pink Pollock's only kind of studio-backed film with a kind of decent budget. I mean, he made one or two films. He made... Um, Following this, he made Mother, which had a decent budget as well. And then The Muse, which was lower budget. And before that, he'd been making sort of smaller films like uh, Modern Romance and Lost in America. But the but Defend Your Life was his kind of film with kind of special effects and things, even though there weren't that many. Now, Albert Brooks is one of those uh, rare directors who is more verbal than visual. So he's not a director where you lose massive amounts of understanding the film by not seeing it in the cinema. It's not, they're not like those kind of films. It's like, they are, they are shot nicely, but their, their intent is more about the acting and the dialogue than like lots of visual excitement. It's just not really where he's at. Because he is primarily a writer and performer. It's just like, um, the other stuff is of less, less interest to him. And that's just the way he is. So that's just a warning. If you go and watch the film and expect some something exciting to happen, it doesn't happen. The excitement is in the ideas and then how Brooks uses dialogue and characters and actors to get his ideas across. So so that's just the get out of the way quickly thing. Um, so real life was made just as he was becoming well known as a kind of comedian who was very ironic and he, he was beloved by other comedians but the mainstream audience weren't that interested I mean none of his films have made that much money which is why he had problems making films and why the films always came like after so many years between them it was like it was a it was a, a hard time for him to get money for his films all the films are good it's just that it's he just found it very difficult to get the funding for them. It's just like they're critically acclaimed, but they're not like films that people rush out to see. Like kind of films people will see in TV later, if they can get put on somewhere and get advertised. It's that thing is you have to kind of, you kind of have to look them out more than um, just wait for them to turn up on Netflix or something. So he's he's much more in the Schrader level of distribution is what I'm trying to say is you get an odd mainstream film for him but most of the time you have to look for the film even though him and Schrader are very different in lots of ways but the, the both are more focused on writing and the acting than the visuals well Schrader started out with interest in visuals but he kind of focused more on acting as he went on um, and writing so Real life is, is basically an idea of reality shows well before there was such a thing as reality shows. It's the idea of what happens when you observe something? Do, do, do you change it? Because Albert Brooks plays Albert Brooks. He's playing a fictionalised version of himself who, in this version, is a complete dickhead. Really. There's no way around it. He's vain, self-serving. It's that thing where, obviously, he finds it funny to play himself as the most obnoxious person in the film. And he just goes for it. This guy is deluded, um, smug. He's pretentious to something he doesn't understand. And he never, the basic problem with this character is he never understands what he's advocating for. He's advocating for stuff to, to help himself. And he'll use whatever theory he can get. But it's always like, look at me, look at the genius of me. And how can we adjust things? To make it suitable to me, how can I make myself comfortable in this situation? How can I always look like I'm being charitable with what I'm doing, look what I'm doing with my time? And he's just a guy who doesn't really know why he's doing things. He's got lots of blind spots, just like most directors do, and most writers do. And most, I mean, basically anyone else has tons of blind spots, which they don't understand half the time, and they don't know what's driving them half the time. This is taking it to the extreme of someone who's had a little bit of success and has gone to their head, so they're even more delusional than normal. 
and the, and it's someone who's a good speaker so he can talk his way into things and out of things and it takes people a while to understand that he doesn't have a clue what he's talking about and, and, and most of his ideas are fundamentally flawed in so many ways so he creates a situation where they're going to follow this family for a year to, f- to see real life as it's lived like what is real life rather than what the, what's the fiction, fiction what views the fictional lives and how it's always fake so let's look at real life and see how it actually stacks up and he ignores the most basic obvious thing is that real life's boring real life has moments that you can take out but most of the time it's you're in your head and it's from the outside it doesn't look that interesting <laughs> Which is fatal if all you've got is a camera to watch something. That's fatal when nothing's really happening that's interesting. Or exciting. Or you don't have an angle on it that will make it exciting. Like, it's, it's not like this is a Robert, Robert Bresson film where he finds ways to f- use fiction and the way people are very non-responsive in real life to create something. This is like, something's, why is nothing happening? Something should have happened, it's real life, and it's like, he hasn't understood what real life is. So, he's flawed to start, he hasn't understood his subject in any possible way. Nor has he understood the fact that by being filmed, it makes you change your, your actions. Because you know, you, you know you're being watched, and when you're being watched, you are going to be less... You're not going to be as relaxed, you're not going to make the, the jokes as well because you're worried, worried that you might see someone offensive to somebody your, all your awkwardness comes out more if you've been observed so it's not so instantly even if they didn't do anything overt it's watch has already changed it because you are on guard all the time and the fact that these people are on guard instantly means that nothing interesting is happening for them and Everyone's getting frustrated because the people who are getting watched in a cast led by uh, Charles Grodin and his wife played by Frances Lee McCain, they are they know they're being watched and it's driving them um driving the horror a lot with nuts and she starts to go about crazy and starts to have an interest in Albert Brooks for a second, then she backs away goes, That's a bad idea. And um Charles Grodin's trying to look professional, trying to be responsible and reasonable and try and give himself as good and as a bland look as possible so that he cannot be criticised in any possible way, which again is very defensive and uh, just makes him look very unsympathetic because he's panicking about being observed and it just becomes this thing about being observed and being in, in a situation where the parameters have been set up in all the wrong ways and well, how does that affect the people who are running the test and the people who are in the test if you're dealing with a very flawed system that's based on the, the assumption that human beings will ignore cameras. And these guys have cameras on their heads. So you don't see the faces. And it just looks like a sci-fi movie and very ridiculous, which is intent because it's a comedy. And this film just becomes this thing about how people trap themselves either in delusions of an Albert Brooks character or in their real life in a a life where which is very normal and it's like like how do you get out of this feeling of nothing's happening to your life really and the sense of disappointment and then you're suddenly you put yourself in a prison where you're getting, you're getting observed and it's the thing you thought you wanted because these people volunteered for this and then you realize it's not what they wanted at all because people are flawed and don't think things through even if you think you think things through you're not thinking things through because you're only thinking through an idealised version of what the situation is. You're not thinking about the actual reality of what the situation is, which is the main flaw of this situation, which is the point of the film. <laughs> so it's a really funny film, and it sets up, shows you what the setup is of it, which is Albert Brooks talking about what he's going to do, and then and you start to see the cracks even before it starts, then you see the process of choosing the family, how flawed that is, and you get to the family itself, and things go wrong, because Charles Grodin plays a vet, who, who because of the camera intrusion, makes a fatal mistake, 
because he's been watched do the surgery. <laughs> and, and that panics him. And it's just everything leads to more and more mess. And it just it's just a disaster. And the people who are funding that are looking at this stuff and going, this isn't right, this is boring. And the people who are analysing it as the scientists are saying, everything you're doing is fundamentally flawed. This is not the way to do it. Talbot Brooks' captain, he's like ignoring them all. And it's just like... And they've got their own ego involved in it as well because they've... Um, this is a disaster. It was bad in them. So everyone's got their own interests. And it's a very funny film. But it's not a film about tons of jokes. It's a film about the situation's funny and how further can we take that situation. It's something that was obviously an influence on Ricky Gervais and Stephen Merchant for um, The Office. And the Office is basically the next level beyond this of watching people but doing it in a workplace rather than a home place. So it's basically a similar idea, but you don't see the people behind the experiment. But it's it's still kind of it's taking that idea. And um the reason I see the office point influence is because office is a lot of it's about the mechanism of what's happening when you're being observed, which is what this film is about. It's not about the jokes, it's about the but the behaviour of being observed and how it does funny things to you. So Real Life was Albuquerque's first film. It came out and no one watched it. Apart from a few f people. It came out when I was about three, so I have an excuse for not seeing it. <laughs> um, so uh, Defend Your Life came out, I think it was 1990, 1981. It was, um, it came out in America, did okay, and I, I think it came out in Britain, but I never saw it, and I don't know when it was released, it just felt like it was a film that was kind of released and then it was gone almost instantly. It was like, um, yeah, catch a video. <laughs> it's that kind of thing. Some American films are released very vaguely in Britain. Like, I think they get a couple of plays in the main cities and that's it. And this was one of those kind of films. It's a very Albert Brooks type of release. If, and that, that's his version of a wide release. So it's about a guy who in the first few minutes you see him in his life and then he d dies in a car crash and the whole point of the film really is he has to defend his life against a prosecutor played by Lee Grant and he's been defended by Rip Torn and um, and he basically has to defend all of his actions which have been led by fear throughout his life because he's a very fearful guy and he's He's been divorced. He's um, he, he's not dealt with things well. He's not he's not jumped through his life and created something for himself. He's just always been defensive. And and the whole idea of this afterlife is to move through to the next level of life. You have to get over your defensiveness. You have to kind of move forward and actually find a way to be beyond the basic fear. So that's what you're judged on. It's not judged on um, great achievements. It's like, why were they great? Why, why, how were you, what did you achieve in life? And why did you achieve in life? And uh, were you fearful? Or were you a disaster? Or what? And Albert Brooks knows from the start he's in trouble because he's lived a life of fear. He has to defend himself against people who can see through all his bullshit. So that's the premise. So you see, you get moments of his life played on a screen and he has to try and defend himself. Also in the film, The Afterlife, because he's in purgatory, basically. Purgatory is great. You can eat all the food you want. You can, and you never get fat. But it's only, it only lasts a week until your trial's over. And then you either get sent back, or you move onwards. And he falls for Meryl Streep's character here. She's also going through a trial, but she's acing it. She's um, had some flights before, and now she seems to have figured it out and she's having a good time and she did everything right in her life and she's the, the actual opposite of Albert Brooks' character. He's like fearful and she's not anymore. But with them together, once they connect, she's a good influence on him to actually make him want to actually be better than he was. It's just like this influence actually helps him. And it's like, is this enough to get him to move on to the next stage, or is he, is Willie, we go back towards fear? 
And that's the basic premise of the film. It's all set in the afterlife. There's lots of jokes about the afterlife and all the mechanics of the afterlife and all the mechanics of life itself and how we react to things. And it is kind of, it's basically a riff on A Matter of Life and Death by Press, Pill and Press Burger. But it's a very good one. It's not as good as A Matter of Life and Death, but it's a good afterlife comedy because a lot of afterlife comedies are pretty boring. It's kind of very difficult to make them, make them interesting. Usually, comedy is usually the best route because you can have fun with it. I mean, uh, Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey had done a nice sequence in heaven, which was fun. You know, that tends to be where you can really get, you can point out contradictions and weirdness of the situation, which is not what this film does. This film is about, yeah, there's weirdness in the film and they set up, they have jokes about heaven, but... The main joke is about Albert Brooks' character not being able to move on. It says his flaws. I mean, heaven stuff's a metaphor for not being able to move on in real life and not being able to be, you know, a bit free of yourself and just move on from your fear. That's what the main point is. And it's a character actually having to recognise that he's, um, how trapped he has been in fear. So in some ways, it's not as intellectual as real life. And I liked real life more than this, but I really liked this as well. I saw when it came out um, on video, I enjoyed it, but it never really stuck with me. But I rewatched it because uh, it's now available on Criterion. I liked it a lot more. It's just like I think some of it is just having lived a bit of a life rather than watching as a teenager. It's a it's a different thing because um, you, you can identify with him a bit more, but also you can see a lot of it's his own fault. So the good thing is they don't ever try and make him look like he has there's any excuses for what he did wrong. There's no excuses. He was just cowardly. And that's the fun part of the joke is um, the Rip Torn and what what was an early comic performance by him because he was known as a serious actor before he went into comedy in the 90s. He's just looking at this thing and he's like, oh, you're doomed. <laughs> you're just doomed. There's nothing there's nothing we can do with you. This is like this is a disaster of a person. And just the whole thing is like everybody just is like instant fail. This will take long. So he really he's really got it up against it. And uh, all of Riptone's excuses for him are very half hearted because he, everyone knows his bullshit. <laughs> so there's a lot of humour and a lot of humour comes from the um awkwardness of everyone knowing this lead character is not the most ideal character. It's just when you see him with Mel Streep's character, you actually see the other side of his character and what could be if he could get away from the fear that he's always inhabiting. And you get an idea of why he's fearful, like what his upbringing was and what's um, what, what was dragging him down. But it's that thing of, is that will he be brave enough to move forward? So... Yeah, this is a very enjoyable film. They're both very enjoyable. I'd, I'd highly recommend both of them. Real Life is, I think it's coming out in Criterion soon, but it's also in the UK, it's available. I got it cheap on um, iTunes, because Paramount and iTunes always release the back catalogue every couple of months for a few quid, <laughs> you know, which is the way I got it. But um, I'm definitely interested in getting the... Uh, getting physical media to actually have like the extras and a decent cop decent print of it and things so or not a decent print a decent um 4k of it or blu-ray of it whatever which i'm sure will be much nicer than the one i've got but uh yeah there's it's definitely uh, something to, definitely, definitely worth watching because they're very enjoyable just do not expect them to be visually arresting that's not the point in real life, the whole point is it's not officially arresting, it's, it's boring real life. It's, it's, it's almost the, 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 that one to go out of the way to not make it visually arresting, because that's part of the joke. So, um, hope you enjoyed the video. I'll be back soon with another one. Bye. <laughs>